Sir, can we start? Sir, you can start. Yeah, okay. No, it's okay. Thank you. So, uh, good evening to all of you. I think this is the 104th session on our challenging case series. I will show my first case now. Is the screen visible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is a story of a 65 year old man. He gave his step clumsiness of right hand for the last one year. He step imbalanced while walking with his step falls for the last six months. So we two complaints, clumsiness of right hand and imbalance with recurrent falls. Now, I, I go to the examination. I, I, in this case, here, in this presentation, I have divided into three, four videos showing each finding to sort to depict one particular clinical important uh, sign. Now, let us check first the eye movements in this patient. This is the eye movement. So I'm showing my finger. It's going to follow the finger rapidly. Rapid movement on the finger. The right and left. I mean, we should target to follow. Okay, so what did we observe? We observed that the circuits are there, but a little slow compared to that of a normal one. Okay, now let us see the next video, the same patient. He wanted disease, I did not show my finger. Only ask him to look to the right and the left. The first part. The second part, I held his hand to the right and left side. Ask him to remember where the hand is. And then look to the right and the left. Okay. Now let us see the first. Step. Right. Left. Okay. Okay. Ask him to look to the left and the right hand. So, what did you observe? Yes, no circadian movement on asking to do just look to the right and the left. What remembered visual target of his hands. That means he has no saccadic movements and predictive saccades as well as memory guided saccades. On the other hand, I've shown the finger earlier and then moved the finger across, you could have some movements. Now, what is what is the lesion responsible for this disparity and is what is its relevance? So I'll come to that later. I'll finish my case and then come to that particular point, clinically important one. So let, let, let's go to the rest of the ocular muscle examination and especially the speech. The ocular muscle. In your belly, then follow you, eh? In your belly, then follow you. Better talk to you, eh? Perfectly normal. Belly, then no knocker, eh? Where I'm going to knock it, eh? Perly, then no knocker. Knocker, knocker, knocker. Perly, then no knocker, knocker. Perly, then no knocker. We can date, eh? We can date, eh? We can date, eh? See, his pursued movement is perfectly normal. The second part is asking, let's say the vestibular ocular. He camera is in the nocker. Where so that shows that his pursuit is normal, his VOR is normal. So the problem is entirely of a saccadic movement system. Now let's see the first of the examination. And this look at the speech of this patient particularly. Okay, 
is each yes, case progressively decreased <laughs> So, what did you observe in his speech? One is the volume of the speech progressively becomes less and less and stops. So, one not only the volume becomes less, the speech also stops in midway. So, the volume becomes progressively low and the speech stops in midway. That is pleasing in mid-action. And this is just like our kidneys with the hand when you ask the patient to repeat repeated uh, fast movements of the fingers. Progressively, the amplitude comes down and ultimately stops. That's classical hand echinacea. Something similar to that, the speech becomes progressively decreased in volume and that sort of tails up and stops before completing the entire sentence. So this just to um, uh, define what is this echinacea is, the term echinacea refers to able to perform a clinically perceivable movement which can present as a delayed response Placing in mid action or even partly abolished on the moment. Okay. Coming to the rest of the examination. It's good rigidity of the right up hand. Left hand is got a normal pole. Power, however, is normal in both hands. See the cane is in the right hand. The left hand goes on flexing and extending, but the right hand stops in the midway. So that's a typical cane is here. So the rest of the ending. No finger nose Both lower limb power is normal. Reflex are also normal. Reflexion. This is the explanation with the normal image, just for my class. The of the patient is for dragging your right foot, the stand rotated, and total loss of arm seen on the right hand. So these are the findings. So what is your diagnosis? Has he got dementia? No dementia. No dementia. Not the simplest syndrome, sir. Possibly okay. early PSP. Okay. Early PSP or late PSP? Okay. Yeah, late PSP. Yeah. With regards to the faults, you can call it early PSP. With regards to his eye movements, it's late PSP. It's early PSP, yes, sir. But PSP is a symmetrical disease. Here is closely symmetric. Right? It's hardly ever moving with a canisier. Probably a canisier. So, basal syndrome, sir? Yeah, it could be cortical basal. But look at the gaze moment. Pulses, canic palsy. Could this be FTDP, yeah. dementia? But, but there is no dementia. Absolutely. Scar 3, sir. But there is no cerebellar attack. You can ask how we thought cerebellar attacks here with permanent extrapolation. But that presentation is symmetrical. Moreover, he has no other, apart from this type, but no permanent signs, no other ocular signs other than the gaze palsy and physical conditions. What about MRI? Before MRI, we'll come to the MRI. Sir, 
sir uh, can't we get the same similar findings in certain case of uh, psp yes yes sir yes. no it's right. so this is called psp pd okay yes good psp pd as well as parkinsonian features because psp classically what is a symmetrical findings in pd is classically asymmetric so here is such an asymmetry moreover in a typical psp the you won't get classical in this as you find here the amplitude will not progressively come down and stop it will be slow but you will not get the classical echinacea like like this that is in pd so this is a combination of psp and pd is a variant of psp called psp pd there are many variants as you know psp pd psp you know, ocular psp cerebellar like that this is one another psp cvs psp progressive uh, in this with gate freezing so many varieties of psps are there they are all basically forty tau per this so so this is one type of a psp okay any any questions regarding the diagnosis before i come to explanation of the oem methods were you testing for motor perception when you are patient to tap thrice no no this i was testing so first time Applause sign means if you tap three taps quickly, the patient can't be able to tap. It's also part of a perseveration of the motor movement. Like, was it tested for motor perseveration? So, yeah, it's a kind of a motor perseveration. Now, why, do you, why do you test that specifically because of frontal dysfunction? Because of gait so, in, in, in PSP, one of the signs described is this applause sign. Sir, so, uh, what were the pull tests in this case? This is positive. Okay. I forgot to forget to have. In fact, I mentioned the examination. It is positive. So, is there any chance for MSS subtype? No, MSS subtype. No, the usually when either two subtype PD as well as subtype autonomic involvement is a very crucial to make the MSS subtype. But that one cannot be. Part two, syndrome. Is that? Yeah. Sir. Uh... Uh, the eye movements are uh, so specific for uh, PSP, you know, compared to these yeah. BGD or... Uh, exactly. Or this is the typical of PSP. Let us know the main idea of bringing the case is not uh, make diagnosis of the uh, so-called PSP variants or this thing. But bring on this particular technical finding which I have thrown earlier in the beginning of my talk. Why the voluntary circuits are affected? The intentional visually circuits are preserved. Now, for that, you must know what is the role of basal ganglia in the, in the control of circadian system. It is basically caudate inhibitor substantia nigra, which inhibits glucagon. That's a fundamental role of his uh, basal ganglia. To elaborate things, the frontal eye field or the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex stimulate the caudate nucleus. Which inhibits the substantia nigra reticulata. Substantia nigra reticulata, as you all know, is always inhibited. It's inhibited the supercoagulus. And the supercoagulus activates the PPR, whatever this moment. So, when there is activation of the frontal IP, frontal cortex, or the caudate nucleus, what is going to happen is that it removes the inhibition from the substantia nigra reticulata supercoagulus. Because the inhibition of the substantia nigra reticulata is taken away from the corporal cortex. So it gets an activation. It's a double inhibition. So it gets an activation. So you can activation the circuit. There is also another pathway with the miscellaneous circuit preserver, is through the substantia of the thalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus directly activates, just like our circuitry in our Parkinson's system, it activates the substantia nigra reticulata. So when STN is stimulated, you're going to get inhibition of the circuit. This is inhibition of pre-colliculus through activation inhibitory SNR collicular pathway. So integrity of this caudate SNR collicular pathway decides whether the circuit to be initiated or not. Now let us see what happened in our patient is that why it is the bistrigger circuit suppressed is because the disease affecting the frontal lobes of the caudate nucleus, which inhibit the so SNR, which I already mentioned, may lead to difficulties in initiating the voluntary circuits in tasks that require learned or behavior. The patient's caudate and bilateral interphone nucleus show abnormalities of pedicure and memory gated circuits, 
which are both internally generated, but visually guided circuits, which is called bit blue, as well as 90 circuits, both triggered by a visual target are known. So that's the importance of this particular finding. If you find this disparity, always think that least is likely to be the basis of any game. Now, why this is, I'll skip this slide. See, for the visually guided circuit, the, the, the input goes from the frontal light field and directly goes to the colliculus and also goes to the PPRM directly. And the input comes from the posterior parietal cortex to the frontal light field. So it does not involve the basal ganglia for the generation of both anti-circuits as the visually guided. That is why they are relatively preserved Immediately they can get involved, but preserved early in the phase of PSC, PSP. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Shall we continue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, the last class, there's two weeks back, when Dr. Buchino asked me to about the mechanism of second transportation. And I promised at that time I'll show the diagram which I have created uh, earlier. So I thought I'll, I'll take only two or three minutes to explain this. Now, for that, you must a little bit know about the role of the cerebellum. Cerebellum influences trajectory circuit in many ways. First, it provides an additional drive that increases the acceleration of the maximum velocity. Second, it monitors the progress of the circuit and adjusts the trajectory as needed to keep the light on the track to arrive at the target that is controlled online. Third, it helps to end the circuit at just the right time by chopping off the circuit. The first is like of intention tremor or the dysmetria where the, uh, where the, the, the finger has to, when you reach the, exactly the finger, as a stop, it's not overshoot or undershoot. So the error, so-called error correction, is basically cerebellum is a correcting mechanism. Uh, as far as cerebellum, this control is concerned, the two, part, the, the, the two controls of the cerebellum on the second system are two. One is the control in the second accuracy. Where we are interested, they are explained the abnormalities of second accuracy. Here, the part of the cerebellum which is involved are the dorsal vermis and the vestigial nucleus. The other is the flocculus and parafloculus, which stabilizes the node integrator. That is the lesion of which was the lesion of nystagmus, lies straight away from the eccentric position, and responsible also for the perfect matching of the pulse of this term, resulting in hypermetric and hypermetric circuits. Or not circuit, but it's a kid. The weaning of the, the ill sustained circuits. Now, let's come to our the first control, the dorsal vermis and the nucleus. This modulates the amplitude of the circadian pulse, drives the burst neurons of the contactal circuit, and provides a late break for the ipsilateral circuits. I will explain by this diagram. How does this V over the FOR? FOR is the the staged ocular motor region, that part of the focal nucleus concerned with the ocular motor control. Now, you all know about this particular, uh, the, the basic PPRF uh, and the abdominal nucleus pathway, which stimulates the cerebral lateral rectus and through them to the right contralateral abdominal nucleus to produce the gaze movement to the cell left side. Now, what does this do? Here, the vestigial ocular motor region, the, the area. The stimulation of it will stimulate the contralateral PPR. See, right side of the nucleus stimulate the left PPR through the hook pandilla press. So, what happens is that when you when the right nucleus is stimulated, it will be push for the case to circadian movement to the opposite side. So it facilitates the circadian movement to the contractile side. There's one more important action. Main action is that it also fires towards the end of the ipsilateral circuit. So, for circadian to the we want to move circadian mode to the right side towards the end of the circuit. It also fires because it has to apply the break for the ipsilateral circuit to stop the eye movement when it reaches the desired eye position. 
So just like our, you know, the, the, the mark plane landing on the aircraft, aircraft, aircraft carrier. So it lands and suddenly the parachute opens in the back to produce a break so that the plane will not go further, something like that. The second is moving to the right side. It has to stop accelerating at that point. So it produces a break. This break is because the contrail circadian system gets activated. So it produces a break. It pulls to that direction, pulls towards the left side. So you put a break for the right side. This is the function of the vestibular vestigial nucleus. So when there is a leash of the vestibular nucleus, what is going to happen is that in the eye movement towards the opposite side is set. at least the same side is facilitated. And the break is not there. So when the break is not there, I will move further towards the same side. So you get an C push. So this vestigial nucleus is in turn inhibited by dorsal worms. So in addition to the dorsal vermis, the, the, uh, the, uh, what you get is exactly the opposite. So it's already told the vestigial nucleus produces C push. Dorsal vermis lesion will produce contractors. So this is how the pulsions are produced. So the main action of the nucleus is putting a breaking action. Now in lateral mandibular syndrome, how this ipsi pulsion is occurring? Now this is the um, this is the nucleus which is talking about. And as already told before, the process activates on lateral PPR. This is a PPR of the opposite side. Sir, uh, sorry to. Uh, stop you, sir. There is a lot of disturbance, sir. We are unable to hear you clearly. Uh, okay. It's, it's broken. Voice is broken, sir. Broken voice. Is it broken? Then I uh, don't know what to do about that. This is the. Uh, so I think. Um, sir. Uh, Logging again may be helpful. May be helpful. Okay, okay. sure. I, I'll log in again. Thank you. I'll do that. I'll do that. Is the screen visible to you? Yes, yes sir. Yes. What yes, about sir. my my own? I remember my speech. It's normal, sir. normal, sir. Good. Okay. I think from where it has become broken, I don't know. So I just mentioned repeat what I already said. The, for the security pulsion, you have to know the function of uh, vestibular uh, vestigial nucleus, which is the controlling center for the. Uh, the circuit is completely controlled. No, this is the basic gaze pathway, which all of you know. This is the PPR, which activates the abducing nucleus, which stimulates the ipsilateral abstractus, and through the MLF, activates the contralating major factors, producing the gaze movement towards the left side. This much, you know, everyone knows this pathway. Now, what is the function of the vestigial nucleus? is that that will stimulate the contralateral PPR to the hook bundle of thrust. Now, what, so staging nuclear stimulation does what? It naturally will activate the contralateral circuit. So the function of this is to produce a push forward towards to produce a contralateral circuit because it fires at the beginning of the contralateral circuit. But to produce a push to produce a circuit to the contralateral circuit. It also does one more thing. At the end of the skin, also it fires. Why? That is quite a different function. Because in the beginning it fires, it produces a push towards the left side. You get some circuit movement on the opposite side. But towards the end of the ipsilateral circuit, if it's the circuit to the right side, this first nucleus again fires. The purpose is to produce an activation of the contralateral gaze and gaze, gaze movement. To produce a break for the right side end is. Now I was telling this um, similarity to uh, the, uh, where the air, how the airplane lands on the aircraft carrier. 
when the plane lands, so there is not much space for the landing uh, landing in the airplane. So immediately the parachute opens on the behind and puts a mm-hmm. brake, so the plane cannot go further. Something similarly to right wide circuit is aborted, you know, is prevented from overshooting by contraction of the left sided gaze center. This is what is a pull backward of the right wide circuit. Okay, it's called a braking circuit. So when there is a lesion of the fistulated nucleus, what will happen? They will, I will tend to move towards the same side of the fistulated lesion. It's called a Ipsi impulsion. So I mean, what will happen to the opposite side? The opposite side will be less if I give you hypermetric towards the contact itself. So fistulated nucleus lesions will produce Ipsi impulsion because favors because of the inhibition of the uh, of the uh, last part of the circadian movement at the same side. So it produces an over, overshoots uh, from the end point. This vestigial nucleus is inhibited by two cell bermis. Okay, so what will happen means if this vestigial nucleus I already told produces a person, the opposite to what you get in that endocell bermis lesion, that is you have a contraction. Now let us see how does this occur in lateral syndrome. That's our patient which I have discussed last. <coughs> how does it occur? Because <coughs> this is a procedure we were talking about. It stimulates the contralateral PPR through the hook bundle. This procedure nucleus is inhibited by cerebellar by Mrs. Already told. But what I have not mentioned earlier is that. There is another pathway from the inferior olivary nucleus, which goes to the inferior bit of the cerebellar pedangle, and which inhibits the cerebellar vermis. So, when there is a lesion of the inferior cerebellar pedangle, as occurs in lateral syndrome, <coughs> let us see the lesion there. What is going to happen? This inhibition on the cerebellar vermis is taken off. So, they'll be overacting. Overacting cerebellar vermis will produce overaction of the inhibition of the fistulated nucleus. The fistulated nucleus is inhibited. So, circuit to the contact side is inhibited. So, you get an Ipsi pulsion. That is, you get Ipsi pulsion in inferior cerebellar pedangulation. Let us see what is going to happen. The same, the superior cerebellar pedangle after crossing. The lesion is after crossing naturally. The same, it put the lesion there. It is again producing the Favored pulsion to the opposite side, you get a contract pulsion. But here, the same loop, but it is not called the after It is not after crossing. It is not after crossing. That is why you get inferior cerebral produce C pulsion and superior cerebral This is the superior cerebral producing a contract pulsion and a pulsion. I think I'll skip the rest of the time. In focus is for the controlling the. Neural integrate. Okay. Any questions? Before we go to the case signal. Sir, this patient pathology is um, I mean. Uh, eyes basic pathology is PSP. This is a neuropathy. Neuropathy, correct. So they may not respond to uh, dopa, uh, dopa, sir. I mean, leo yeah. dopa. Yeah, in fact, you know, there are many PSP patients who do, uh, who do respond to leo dopa very well, but the response is much less compared to that of EWPD. And moreover, even though they respond very well initially, they rapidly need to escalate the dose and ultimately that fails to produce a response. Some PSP pain does not respond much, but some respond very well, very well. Especially PSP PD patients, there is quite a much better response than the classical state Jackson type of PSP. Sir, uh, will you use Jonisamide for better succades, sir? <laughs> Jonisamide for succades. No, I don't know. It can be used, used for it is used for tumors, so it is, but I don't know for circadian it is useful. 
yeah okay so there are some cases okay 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 sir. and there is actually one variant of psp where the only presentation initially is the ocular muscle no other features later on only develop for years can come, come to with only gates pass that is the om type of psp psp om yes sir okay thank you sir okay no uh, minute so i think uh, very uh, infrequently only we are discuss patients of high mental functions but i'll show two three high mental function cases no what I, this um, this is regarding the speech abnormality which is in malayalam which some of you may not be able to understand well still you can make out the abnormality here now what is the abnormality of the speech which is noticed in this patient's uh, speech തിരുവനന്തപുരം When you ask to spell out each syllable by syllable, wow. he is able to tell that. but i'm very he cannot come be i'm bring out the word da ta o so i think so what you observe here is that when you ask him to say pa ta ka indirectly you will be able to tell each syllable when say pa ta ta ka you could say you could say but when you see ask him to repeat pa ta ka he can only tell one or two maximum not more than that so single syllable he can speak but all the syllabic words he cannot speak so the patient can say single syllables but unable to say all the syllabic words when you ask him to say tiruvananthapuram each each syllable he was able to say but combined he could not tell the word and mm-hmm. the phenomena which is observed is just like our first patient has a trailing of the volume of the sound in his speech is also there in the speech now another patient with a severe with a different speech abnormality due to the same disease, same disease patient which have come tell you what is this is later on with a different speech abnormality look at this patient's speech achal asun todangiya dengana asun todangiya dengana ah oru yetta mokala kalyanam kaliyirittu അത് കഴിഞ്ഞതിന്റെ ശേഷം ഒന്ന് വീണ് വീണ് അഞ്ച് മിനിറ്റ് ബോധം ഇല്ലാതെ വന്ന് അത് കഴിഞ്ഞു ആ അത് അപ്പഴ് ആശുപത്രി കൊണ്ടുപോയി അത് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് ഒരു കുറച്ച് നാള് കഴിഞ്ഞതിന് ശേഷം is got marked difficulty to initiate the speech he said okay this is on this anomaly and you which observed is not part of a syndrome which will come later on now the, what is this abnormality in speech in the same patient i am asking to listen to the speech very carefully moonu vaakkal repeat cheythu parana adanalle same part ta ka endu vekkanda pa ta ka endu parayume adu adhe pole tirichu parana adu parana അങ്ങനെ അഞ്ചു പ്രാവശ്യം പറഞ്ഞു പറഞ്ഞേച്ചാ പറഞ്ഞ ധൃതിയില്ല പാ പറഞ്ഞ പാട്ടയത്തിന്റെ ടാ ആ ടാന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു ആ ടാന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു 
കോട്ടയത്തിന്റെ when he asked him to complete the uh, when he said the word like a quatrain he said pronounce the ta correctly that means the same consonant he cannot bring out in the same way all the time sometimes he able to tell mispronounces it sometimes it pronounces correct so what this is also the problem one word the same consonant is pronounced in a different ways different times so the, what is this speech disorder ഇമ്പോർട്ടന്റ്ലിസ്റ്റന്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ്റ
road clearing, lip smacking guarantee, complex or socially inappropriate facilities, such as corporate failure. Constant trending, including involuntary and controlled vocalizations, several types of dementia, or also been associated with advanced PSP. Let us see the rest of the exam is patient. So, to find out whether it is for the aphasia, Okay. Okay, so he has no aphasia. So the positive findings I will show. Let's see the ocular muscle examining. Tare. Mold. Mold. Mold out of the okay. Mold out of the okay. Mold out of the okay. Tare. 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 Is gate is a normal gate with a KNC or anything like that? Good arm sing. But his full test was positive. That is, he is still positive. So, so, where do you think is the, what is the, what is the condition of the patient? Diagnosis. PNFA variant. Sir. PNFA variant of PSP. Yeah. This is the PNFA variant of PSP. This is um, exactly correct. So, what is PNFA? You know, PNFA is a progressive new one, non fluent aphasia. It's one of the three clinical presentations of chronotemporary degeneration. PLD can be PNFA, chronotemporary dementia, and semantic dementia. Now, the a salient distinction between pro primary progressive aphasia and PNFA or semantic dementia is that the primary progressive aphasia includes another clinical type, namely the logopenic or phonemic aphasia, which is not represented in the frontal, uh, the frontal uh, chronotemporal dementia. So the PP, there are three types of PPA, PNFA, semantic variant, logopenic variant. I think I'll skip all these things. This is the diagnostic criteria of PNFA, dramatism, and effortful halting speech with inconsistent speech sound, so proxy speech. So I'll skip all these things. Now let us see. This is another case of a proxy speech because this is not exactly the same the speech that's, that's a difference in the uh, inconsistent products with the consonants. Okay, so any questions? So, it will demonstrate two types of uh, PSP PSP PD and PSP uh, PNFA variant of PSP. Okay, I'll go to the next case. Now, what is this speech of pneumonia? This is not in the very previous but it's a different patient. Listen to this speech very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> 
ിസ് <laughs> 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 What is equilalia? Equilalia is echoing others, other speech. It's all known. I think I'll skip all this. Perseveration is repetition of particular response to like words, phrase, or ritual. This is the difference in equilalia and perseveration. Is there. In perseveration, they tend to repeat the whole sentence or whatever they are doing or the action of, or action of speech, whatever it is. Less in parallelia, they tend to repeat only the last one or two words of that particular sentence. Okay. Shall we go to the next case? Yes, sir. Okay. This is going to be a little more tougher case. Again, related to high mental functions. Because I thought we have not taken high mental functions case for a long period of time. This 65-year-old man was brought with a history of poor and got memory loss for the last six months. See, for a layman, for the bystander, everything... Why? Even from the combined memory, no sir. Look at this animal. Show only the abnormalities in the patient's uh, the key findings in the patient. Yes, not in the examination. In the case, I am going to ask him point or something. I got doctor Ani. Who are the doctor Ani? Pass. Who are the doctor Ani? Pass. Then I say what? Then I do other part. Matter the. This, 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 this. That's the doctor. So he said correctly. He said watch. He said pen. He said pass. The key, of course, the is not the usual key which he should have seen. He should have seen earlier. So he named all the three objects correctly. Okay. Now let's see next video. The same page. I'm showing a pen and asking, is it a pen? I must be is it a brush? ിസ് വാട്ട് ഇസ് ഇറ്റ് There is no answer. Is it a brush? No reply. Was, what is it used for? Can be used as a brush. Is it a paper? No answer. Can be a paper. Is it a pen? Can be used as a pen. Is it a spectacle? Can be used as a spectacle. Is it a pen? Again, repeat the questions. No answer. So this is the abnormality here. So, He named the objects on his own. And when asked, is it a pen or is it a paper, he could not tell the name. Okay. When I asked that question, he could not tell. But spontaneously, he told the names of all the objects correctly in the initial. And when, are, when the objects are placed on the board. So what is this problem? Sir, did he touch those objects before answering correctly? Now that will come later on. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Visual agnosia, sir. Visual agnosia. Yeah. What do you what do you, what do you say? This could be correct. It could be visual agnosia because he could not recognize. Then only he can uh, say the use of the object. But how did he name initially? He was mm-hmm. visual agnosia. He named all the three objects when they were placed on the bed. 
he was stretching uh, everything so probably no, no, he was different no, model no, no, in no, no, visual no. modality in visual modality no, no. he was uh, no, 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 i'll tell you you said even before touching he said watch so that's what the matter there idi 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 adan to Is even without touching, even if he touched the key, uh, the, the watch correctly, as he said before, even before touching, he told the name. Yes, sir. Uh, Conceptual. Can be visual anomia, visual anomia, uh, optic aphasia, or uh, visual agnosia. Okay. Sir, he consistently didn't answer the pen. Yeah, subsequently, no, I framed the question differently. Is it a pen? He did not say answer. Semantic. So, that is semantic. No, the, uh, the, if it is semantic, agreed. How did he name initially? It means he has lost the conceptual apraxia. Sir. It's not an apraxia part because it's not a no problem in motor activity. It's a problem of recognition and naming. Which difficult to come to this area. So, see, is it a case? Let's see. Is it this case of anomia? But no, it's he named them in a, in a initially. So that means it's not a problem of anomia. Is it a case of semantic loss of objects? Then how did he name with the objects initially? The semantic loss with the recognition. The semantic anomia, semantic loss means it does not have the no, the memory of that object at all from his brain. Brain is devoid of that object's memory. Can you read that? Then is it a single word comprehension when it's sodium sodium second time? Yes, it is possible because second time I asked, is it a pen? Suppose he is not comprehending what I said, he would have problem in bringing out that answer. That's called a single word comprehension. Okay, that's a possibility. Now see the next video of the patient, same patient. <laughs> Oh, as Samia was telling, I asked him what is it. He did not say. Asked him to feel that coin. Still, he did not say. Could it be a thalamic uh, lesion producing that uh, something called quasi aphasia or something? Where uh, his, I uh, mean, uh, ability to answer uh, goes on, goes on varying uh, at different times. Yeah, in the the, the cause of aphasic syndrome of Gloria in thalamic lesion, they have got a problem in recognizing the object, feeling the object and recognizing it. Now, let's see now. Let us see the particular. Forget about the previous. Let us come to this particular case. He should be still like no see. He could not tell the object by you uh, tell the use of the object. He should be one could naturally think could be be still like no see. But it is not be still like no see because in be still like no see, he should have been able. He would have been able to recognize by other sensory modality like touch and touch. But he would not. He could not recognize the object even by palpating it. So it is not visual agnosia. 
only if it is a hypnosis problem. Either he has got a vision and tactile agnosia like or a semantic memory loss, as uh, Swami was telling. So, if you get enabled to recognize an object through various sensory modalities, by touch, hearing, or, or, or vision, it is more logically likely to be a semantic loss rather than an agnosia of all the three sensory modalities. So, most of the cases, it's only during certain times. It's only during certain times. It's not semantic. If it had been semantic memory thing, then he would not have recognized in the first place. Uh, it'll come it'll come to the yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, perfectly right. Yeah, perfectly right. So there's so this confusion here, no? It is a lot of that's about the case. So if it's a semantic loss, I already named the object initially. That's this the second video which is shown clearly tells you it is semantic loss, but the previous video does not. Tell you with that. Let us sir, uh, sir, in a pure, de pure word of deafness, how uh, can they uh, recognize the objects by touching or by some yes, other product? Yes, in pure word deafness, the only problem is recognition the verbal, verbal recognition of the, I mean, the, of the, the sound. All other things will be normal. The speech again will be normal. They can rec even uh, recognize the object and uh, tell the name. No problem in that. They can use the object, everything. Only problem is that by sound modality, they cannot recognize the word. They pure word deafness. Now, this is Joy's question. How did he name the object initially spontaneously? Now, for that, you must I just tell you the gnosis model to understand how this can is possible in such patients. Again, I will take two minutes to explain it from the basics. Now, in fact, the recognition object is a, is a symbolic representation which involves basically three steps. One is a primary sketch, second is a viewer centered and two dimensional sketch, that is, the object centered three dimensional sketch. I'll tell you what each one is. The basic thing is the primitive representation comprising of brightness intensity changes, which forms the primary sketch. But that is not enough. From the primary sketch, it has to form to what is called the viewer centered representation or a two dimensional representation. Here, the object is perceived as the patient is viewing that object. So, it represents the object with the viewer centered frame of reference. So, if this step is possible, in, and this viewer centered representation is there, they'll be able to tell it's a line. Okay, in this, in this uh, projection of the picture. But if it is projected this way, the person will not be able to tell it is a line. Because what is represented only this is can I recognize as a line. So if from the viewer centered two-dimensional representation, it equals to what is called the object centered representation. Here, what happens is that the visual coordinates of the or this representation coordinates the shape and features as they are related to one another, related to one another. The features of the object itself is related to one another. That's called the object centered frame of reference. So, in this representation, in whatever way the object is projected, if you rotate the object in whatever way, you can recognize that object from above, from below, to the side, and also in whichever way you view the patient, see the patient in recognizing. So, they can recognize a line not only from the front. If you only show the, uh, the, the bottom of the lion with that tail, they will say it is a lion because here got that the three dimensional perception of the object. So these are the this all comes under the perception part of it. Now we go to this is the basic steps in the basic vision analysis. Now, from this object centered presentation is how a real recognition and the matching comes. The third step is matching, that is the ability to match the output of the visual perceptual uh, processing with the representation of the same object stored in your memory. When you see a lion, you have to, uh, to compare it with the memory of a lion in your memory bank. It's called matching. That is, it is matched with that memory bank. Memory bank is a semantic conceptual field. Okay, what is this? Then, then lastly, it has to give the attribute the meaning of the stimulus. What is the object? 
Okay, okay. you compared with the previous memory in the brain. It is same as lion. But just given the meaning, it is a lion. So that means the meaning is given by the semantic and sensual field, semantics of that thing. That means lion is a wild animal which can attack you. That kind of a concept you have to give. I have that. I have that. So that is semantics of that object. Now, for so lastly, the naming. Once you recognize the object, it can, be, it can give a name for that. That's a purely linguistic function. That is a project lexicon. You know, there is also remember that from the objects and the presentation, one can is another pathway which can go directly to the chronological lexicon without going to semantic conceptual field. So that, that way also you can name the object. So that's the phenomenon. These are the steps in order of the visual recognition, steps in the visual recognition of the object. So but there is a loss here, the meaning, the, the lesion, the semantic conceptual field. What, what are you going to have? Will have semantic memory loss. Okay, even if you the vision is there, um, uh, that means the memory bank is not there. See, in whatever modality, you will not be able to, to recognize the object by sensory or the visual or the or tactile sensation, you will be able to, uh, able to recognize it because the, it is not there in his brain. Semantics is not there in the brain. So, but the vision is in this pathway here. And you can name without recognizing. Suppose the vision is here. You can name the object, but you cannot recognize it. See, in whatever patients, what has happened? There is a loss of semantics. You cannot recognize by vision or by near, near sensory modality. But you can just uh, slavely, he can name that particular object by, through this pathway. So you can name it by recognizing it through this pathway. So if there is a lesion, so in, in a, in a in, if the lesion, the pathway between the objects and the representation of the summary consult field, they can name with the recognition because they're naming through the other pathway. Okay. So our patient, he could not recognize the object with visual modality as well as the palpation. This means it is not a case of which we say no. Now two possibilities are made. So many dementia or those both visual and tactile dementia is already told. Now, how differentiate? You now, this both is a lesion here and lesion here behaves the same. In a person with visual dementia, you will not be able to recognize um, the particular object, the vision. So many consult pain, again, you will not be able to uh, recognize through the, uh, through the vision. But to other modality you will not recognize. Now, how to differentiate lesion in this connection in, in, in the connection between the objects and the semantic field, like here, or lesion semantic conceptual field? In our patients, how to differentiate these two, apart from palpating and recognizing the other sensory material? That is matching, sir. Pardon? Matching. Matching, sir. Uh, matching does not mean recognition. Matching is only that say it comes from the upper perception only. Matching will be lost only if the upper perception is lost. That's the basic step in the initial, uh, initial steps. You can match an object without recognizing the an object. In a, you the semantic loss also you can match. Here, what is happening here? Semantic loss means it is lost from his brain forever. Whereas obviously the person in this path is affected means whatever you see, that input is not reaching that memory. But that memory is there. This, this is differentiably what we call the loss of visual imagery, which is lost in semantic dementia, but not in visual accuracy. Because the memory is intact in the case of uh, you can dream about the things. Because agnosia is basically a percept without meaning. The perception cannot reach the memory bank, but not the loss of memory bank. The hope to know is that, that object is there in his memory. You can ask him what is the color of banana or things, and he will tell. So this is, uh, the, uh, well, and this is a site where the visual imagery is true. And the visual imagery can be selectively impaired. So they can tell the user if their pathway is affected. 
if it uh, uh, yeah. If parties affect and you can tell you provided if the bush like means you will not able to tell the use because okay. the use only be at the sensory matter. No, use of the what is the use of pen yeah. if you ask yeah. they will be I able think, to tell. No, you again they will not be able to tell because they are they are answering by seeing an object. But just asking what is the use of the object just like that, then you will be able to tell. Yes. What is the use of a pen? He will tell. What is the color of the sky? He will tell. But from the sky, he will not be able to say the sky. So the pen, he will not be able to tell it is a pen. But ask him what is a pen used for? He will tell pen is used for writing. That he will tell. That's what I said, the basic definition is there. Uh, it's a very important uh, definition, uh, the beautiful definition, which I always like. No say is percept, impact perception, but without meaning. That's the definition of uh, uh, no see. The memory is normal, so they can imagine from the memory, no problem. That's why it is the visual imagery. There is a very interesting condition called visual anemia. It's a loss of visual dreaming. So you cannot, you cannot dream about the, the beautiful things which I had in your life even before. It's another syndrome called charcot Willibad syndrome. There is general loss of dreams of normal modalities. Not only really visual, in all modalities, they cannot loss of dreams. And this is happening in the site of lesion for this visual image. So what is the diagnosis now? Now coming back to the same old question what Dori was asking. Why is that the patient did not say yes when the name of the uh, that I'll be for come to that? I'll tell you why he told it initially because he could name through the other pathway, direct pathway, without going to the semantic conceptual field. Now the question is, then why is that he did not say yes when the name of the object is even such I showed him, is it a pen? He did not. That is because he is not able to comprehend what is said. Most likely, yes, can it affect this English word combination along with semantic membranes? Okay. So, what is the final diagnosis? Which condition produces a single word combination problem and semantic process semantic memory? Semantic dementia, sir. Semantic dementia. Perfect. So, semantic dementia. So, these are the features, the main two things, embed confrontation naming. Embed single word comprehension and embed object knowledge, particularly for low frequency, low frequency terms, and surface LCA or discovery, which this patient did not need much of this patient. So these are the features. So this is a many dimension. So, how did he say initially? How did he say? Pardon? Initially, how could, he, how could he name initially if he had a semantic dimension? That's what is for this pathway. So here, no, the naming can be done. This is a separate, the basic upper section is stopping there. From there, it goes through this pathway for the semantic conceptual field. Lesion is here, not here. Here it is semantic loss. Lesion is here, this in particular which I am showing. Here, that means you get a visual here. From the lesion, it cannot reach the memory. So what is happening in our patient is that the lesion is not here, the lesion is here. Sorry, this lesion is in the semantic loss is there. So what will happen? You could name through this direct pathway. It's not recognizing what the object is because semantic concept, semantic area is lost. So you could name without recognizing through this pathway. But then he name every time. The second time also you should be naming then. Using that pathway, the second time also you should be naming, no? Yeah, but second time I did not ask him what it is. I asked him, is it a pen? And that's the way I framed the question. Is it a book? Okay. That was the answer asking. Then the way I asked was to find out to find out whether it's comprehending comprehending or not, ask this way. Is it a pen? Is it a brush? Is it a thing? Things like that. So he's not recognizing what I want, understanding what I am feeling. 
Otherwise, it's perfectly agree with you that it should not happen. You should, when you ask him what he said, he should not told the name. You can't say it's not completely understand, you know, because he, he told that this could be a pen. No, that is only telling whatever it is. He's, he said that it could be a pen. He said the web, it could be a paper. He said the watch, it could be a pen. <laughs> watch like that. That is telling you just for whatever comes in his mouth is telling. Whatever I am asking is a different. It could be, it could be, it could be like that. What is quasi phase? I forgot, sir. Quasi phase, what is that? Oh. In fact, the quasi phase syndrome, it, in fact, I also forgot the complete definition of what it is. This quasi phase syndrome of urea. And let me think for a one minute. Um, that the only problem in the, uh, not a true aphasia at all. I got a problem in um, bringing out the words with, with, with low volume speech. That is mimicking a, uh, uh, at times they will be able to speak uh, speak normally, at times they will not be able to speak at other times. That's called because they face syndrome low really not a persistent loss of speech. Okay, sir. There is one more feature I forgot what it is now. That means it's inconsistent loss of comprehension and, and as well as able to produce a speech. Next time I'll tell you what is cause here basic syndrome of Luria. Uh, one more point is that I, I'm not getting it now. But one thing is certain that combination, everything is not. So this also we can say no, because sometimes it's able to tell, otherwise, other times it's not able to tell. So that could no, be no. Yeah, you know, the, you know, here the person is not able to use the object at all by any other modality. Even putting his hand, a coin in the hand, he's not able to tell. That will not occur in cause of syndrome. It's only a problem in the, in the speech output, in a speech mechanism. The pictures will not be there. So this is the MRI of the patient. See the severe degree of temporal lobe atrophy he has. The best cut you will take is a coronal cut. There you can find on the leaf like temporal lobe on both sides. This the temporal one is so much dilated. The sunken folia of the temporal lobe. Okay, I think it's time is up now. So, any questions? We can take them. Sir, the doubt. If the semantic memory band is lost, how can he initially say it is a pen? Because that word pen has to come from the semantic memory band. Hello, the, what you said is correct. Normally, that is the way it occurs. So, when you show a pen, first the features of the pen should come in the perception. Then it goes to the, your memory bank. Then the image is compared with a similar object in your memory. It is compared. So it is there in the memory. It is the time is that means it's recognition is the pen. Then you have to give the recognition it is an object as the pen. Then that object has to be given the name from the from the, it has gone to the language area. The language area gives the name on the object. So these steps are involved in bringing out the name of the object, naming. That's a normal, usual pattern for naming. But, so you can say when the patient is not able to tell the name of the object, the first thing you have to ask is what is the use of the object. You find out whether it's recognized or not. That's usual. But sometimes patients can name spontaneously without recognizing that object. That's exactly what I've shown in this particular patient. This is not common. It is very, very uncommon. Usually what is in this step, they recognize the object, then only the naming comes. Unless you are not recognized, how can you name? That's a thing, it's good logically thinking. Yes, sir, one more doubt, sir. Uh, before yes. that, uh, we have described the video of apraxia of speech. No? Uh -huh. Apraxia of speech with, uh, yes, yes. with PSP. Yeah. Uh, what was the other uh, case which was uh, shown first? Before that particular video, 
ரெண்டு கேசஸ் சார் காணிக்கல சார் த்ரீ 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 கேசஸ் போத் சேம் அது ஃபர்ஸ்ட் கேஸ் அப்ராக்ஸியா இல்ல சேம் அப்ராக்ஸியா ஸ்பீச் சேம் அப்ராக்ஸி ஸ்பீச் அப்ராக்ஸியா ஸ்பீச் ஓகே சேம் ஆல் தி த்ரீ ஆர் அப்ராக்ஸியா ஓன்லி திங் இஸ் ஷோயிங் தி டிஃபரண்ட் ஃபெனோமெனா தி ஃபர்ஸ்ட் பேஷன் ஹேட் அண்ட் இம்பிள் டு பிரனன்ஸ் தி பாலிசிமெட்ரிக் ஸ்பீச் தி செகண்ட் பேஷன் ஹேட் இன்கன்சிஸ்டன்சி இன்கன்சிஸ்டன்சி இன் தி பிரனன்சேஷன் ஆஃப் சைன் தட் இஸ் தி ஹெசிடேஷன் ஆஃப் தி ஸ்பீச் So the three different, to show the three different aspects okay. yeah, here, I brought the three, two different patients. Both the uh, same thing. Okay. Second, do they have any problem with regard to whistling or other uh, movements of this uh, uh, facial muscles or articulatory no, they, muscles? They, that no, no. will be normal, no, sir? Normal. Only during speech normal. production yeah. it will be affected. It's not a problem of apraxia of other organs. It's not an orofacial apraxia. It's orofacial apraxia for your dealing. But you have got a point. In a person with a severe orofacial apraxia, they cannot speak also very well. But this is only confined to the speech. Only speech problem. All other activities this fellow can, can whistle, can talk, or whatever. Is that the same Thank as femia, sir? Or femia? No, a femia is entirely different. A femia is a person in in lesion seen in the or initially called as Mary Scotland area. That is the area subjacent to the Broca's area lesions. They initially present with mutism, then followed by make a language problem. What is the language problem? It's predominantly a dysarthria. This will take an occurring classical Broca's area lesions. But here the dysarthria will be very prominent. with mild degree of inefficacy. At least the compound is very minimal. They can have grammatism, repetition problem, but much less. They rapidly recover from that except for the mild disarray. Unlike a classical Broca's epilepsy. So, a female is initially mutism followed by a Broca's epilepsy with severe disarray and less of a language. Mutilations in this and then uh, support the health of this area. Any questions? Good night. Good night, good night. Thank you all for patient listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, window.